Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, thank you for the introduction, uh, Chairman. Uh, I, it's my great pleasure to have an opportunity to give a talk in this meeting. And today I'm going to talk about the balloon YouTube dilation and uh, E2 stent. I will introduce my new treatment, balloon dilation, and I'll present a case of this function of Eustachian tube. And we will, I will talk about the result of the Korean YouTube dilation system at Asan Medical Center. And then I give a talk about the, a little bit about the development of YouTube stent. As you already know, the dilatory YouTube dysfunction has many causes and uh, management are limited. That there are lots of causes, intraluminal blockage by the middle of pathology or URI and an allergy and cyanonasal disease can make uh, inflame the mucosa and then uh, subsequently middle of pathology will occur because of the eustachian tube does not function very well. And also adenoid and nasal pharyngeal uh, neoplasms can block the YouTube. And functionally, there might be a problem, especially in cleft palate or cartagena syndrome or cystic fibrosis. And there might be associated middle pathologies like a cholesterol tumor and a tympani membrane atelectasis and also recurrent otitis media. Traditionally, the Barzalba maneuver and the autoinflation was the uh, easy and simple uh, treatment method. However, no, with, without uh, and, uh, except the treatment underlying disease and putting a pressure equalizing tube, we do not have uh, efficient treatment method. However, recently the balloon tube dilation is introduced for the re restoration of the eustachian tube dysfunction. And then nowadays uh, the if efficacy is well proved nowadays. So balloon dilation, was introduced in 2010 by Ackerman, uh, published their first study, which explored the idea of using sinus balloons to dilate the uh, ETV. And in 2018, there was a randomized prospective trial, and they showed that a pretty high percentage of eustachian uh, tube dysfunction around 52%. They show the normalization of the tympanic, uh, tympanogram at six weeks after balloon dilation. And it was pretty good. And these results were durable throughout the uh, 52 uh, weeks after uh, balloon dilation. Uh, currently, many uh, balloon dilation systems are available around the world. Uh, and you, there is an European company, an American company, and there is also an Korean company, actually two Korean companies are producing the balloon system. And generally the length of the balloon is uh, from 16 to 20 millimeter long. And the diameter is around the, from three to six millimeters, which means that there is no consensus about the proper shape, diameter and pressure of di uh, and duration of a balloon uh, uh, ballooning. So, but generally the, the three to six millimeter diameter and up to 20 millimeter long balloon is the usually uh, similar to each other. And I give a chase, a case, rep, a case presentation who is a 55 year old man. He had a chronic otitis media for more than 10 years. He underwent a left corner, open corner a cavity mastoidectomy and ossicular uh, replacement. However, he couldn't do Barsalva maneuver successfully on the left side. So he underwent a revision of plasty. However, there was a fibrosis adhesion in the tympanic cavity and there was no successful uh, uh, el elbow gap and then he underwent a re repeated ventilating tube insertion through the tympani membrane. How was, however, it was not successful. In the end, he underwent the balloon uh, E-tube dilation 
and then he could do Valsalva maneuver successfully and the and the AB gap was very uh, minimal. So which means that it stuck into function is very important for maintaining the middle ear function. And this is, uh, I'll give us some video clips for doing the endoscopic balloon dilation. Uh, I, I generally do this uh, on the local anesthesia and I put the, the tip uh, in, in front of the, my endoscope so I can see the, where the balloon uh, goes going. And then we, we can easily find the instacan tube orifice here and then put the balloon into the, uh, put the catheter into the uh, each the second tube. And then you can see the marker here. And then that, that indicated that the 20 millimeter uh, length are inserted and then you inflame inflate the balloon and then you can wait one minute and then I deflate the catheter and then uh, put the balloon uh, catheter more deeper and then I repeat the ballooning inflating uh, for one, another one more minute and then I remove the balloon. And our experience, uh, we started this balloon dilation in 2016. Uh, and we do the prospective study in, in the beginning of the starting the balloon dilation. And we, most of people were, have, were having a chronic otitis media. And we use the uh, fluoroscope because we wanted to see the, what is happening, what was happening in the balloon and in the uh, estacan tube. And if you use the, this kind of uh, position, and then you can see clearly, there is a, some, this is cochlear and vestibule and mastoid, and this is E-tube, uh, external auditory canal, and this is middle ear space, and uh, this is a, a protein panel and internal carotid artery. So you can clearly sh uh, see where is the balloon is. And this is the uh, fluoroscopic examination. So we used guide wire to, we put the guide wire into the tympanum and then we push the uh, balloon through the guide wire and then we can be sure about the location of the balloon. And then we uh, injected uh, contrast media fill with water into the balloon and then we can clearly see the how large is the balloon is and where the balloon is dilated. And result, so technically we could do a balloon dilation successfully in all the patient and in a Balsalva maneuver was improved in 64% because that preoperatively there was nobody who can do Balsalva maneuver successfully. However, uh, after uh, three months later, uh, about 65% could do Valsalva maneuver, which is very successful. But the problem is that another 35% was not successful. And also there was an improvement ETDQ scores and overall improvement. We uh, reported our result. And there are previously um, lots of papers showing the successful result of the balloon dilation system. So uh, about 72% could do Balsalva maneuver after uh, balloon dilation, which is very successful, high success rate, and there was there were no uh, serious complication re reported. So, which means that very safe and efficient treatment. And what what what's the, the mechanism of the balloon dilation for improving the E2 di uh, functions? It is not well known, but there is a paper uh, regarding the histologic changes of the uh, E-tube mucosa. So, and they propose that the, they might, the balloon might reduce the overall uh, inflammatory burden and may contribute to clinical improvement of ischemic tube functions. And we wanted to see also because that they show the changes of the mucosa. Uh, mu of the mucosa on the nasopharyngeal side. So we wanted to, to see the, what is happening after balloon dilation in cartilaginous 
portion. So we use the uh, red and then we balloon dilated on the left side of the tube and we just use the right side of the tube as a control. This is a histological change. So this is a nasopharyngeal side of mucosa of the Eustachian tube. As you can see, before the dilation, you can see the lots of goblet cells. And this is low power and this is a high power. And after immediately after dilation, uh, the mucosa was lost and then there is a uh, damage. And then uh, after four weeks, the mucosa is uh, well preserved and then goblet cells you, we could see uh, easily. Uh, what about the cartilaginous eustachian tube? This is the cartilage. You know, there's, there is no cartilage here, and this is the cartilage. And then you can see that this is the cartilaginous portion. Immediately after balloon dilation, the cartilage was fractured, and also the mucosa, submucosa, all the areas are damaged. However, one week later, there's a proliferation of the submucosa fibrous tissue and also the, there were hyperplasia of the epithelium. And uh, three months later, the, the epithelium and is nearly normalized. However, there's a thick, a little bit thicker submucosal fibrosis. So this kind of you know, histologic changes we could observe. And we think that this kind of uh, historical change will occur around in the cartilaginous uh, eustachian tube. Uh, our study have a limitation because that we use the normal eustachian tube because that the, usually the balloon dilation uh, is performed for the abnormal eustachian tube. However, we think there might be no difference because that there is no active inflammation in the abnormal E tube uh, so there might be some difference, but there will, would be similar uh, responses. And there is a, uh, as I already mentioned, that there is a randomized control trial and BET was very successful. However, it was not successful for all the patients. So we should do, uh, we should need another uh, treatment modality because that we have a few patients who do not respond to the uh, balloon dilation. And so we wanted to see the, what's the, how large is the cartilaginous to expand it with the balloon because the, we think that there's might be uh, some difference by the different diameter of the balloon system. So we used, uh, uh, as we already mentioned, we use a, a fluoroscope so we can see that how large the cartilaginous E tube expanded. So we measured the diameter of the cartilage, uh, uh, diameter of the balloon, and then a fractional portion and distal portion, actually distal portion was dilated a little bit uh, smaller because that there, I think that because normally the E second tube is very uh, narrow in the distal portion compared to the proximal major pharyngeal portion. So when we apply five atmosphere and then we increase the uh, pressure and then we could see the uh, more higher, di uh, more largely uh, dilated of the uh, Eustachian balloon. But when you see that if we, we applied only three atmosphere, it was enough because that it was dilated more than three millimeters, which is it's a European company have a 3.3 millimeter diameter and they showed a pretty good result. So we think that the diameter of the current, uh, currently available systems are pretty enough. But we don't know that how deep we should do dilated or size, but, and we don't know what the possible role of the stent. And we, because we have a failure cases, we need another option so we can do the repeat, the dial, uh, balloon dilation. However, there should be some other uh, treatment modality, which is a stent for the stenosis, because we, there are lots of stenosis in various uh, systems. 
angioplasty and stents and urinary and gastrointestinal biliary. We know that stents are needed there. So we think that we also need a stent. And we have a, a experience with the urinary stent. And when we use a bare uh, stent, there is a, a restenosis by the hyperplasia. And we, when you use a serolimus, which is a, a to, which is suppressing the granulation tissue formation, we could have a more successful uh, decrease the risk stenosis. So we do the research with the animal model for the stent placement. We use the uncoded stent and serolimus coded stent, and we sacrifice the, the pigs and uh, at four weeks after stent placement. This is the uh, picture of the stent. And we could see that the stent was uh, successfully located here. And we sacrificed the pig and examined the histology examination. And then we could see the risk stenosis. So this is uncoded stent. We are expecting a, a specimen using a serolimus positive uh, stent. And we are expecting more decreased uh, granular formations. So in summary, balloon dilation can be a new option uh, for YouTube di YouTube di uh, dysfunction. And this kind of dilation is very safe and technically easy. And however, the size and pressure and duration of balloon is not well uh, 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 determined yet. And there are still failure cases. So we need a further intervention strategy. So I'd like to Thank to all the all my collaborators here, and this is what I prepared for you. And thank you for your attention.